Uh, before we get into the book of Luke, as we were promised, I want to update you on something that I did last year. You guys remember? Nope. Oh, there it is. You remember this teaching I did last year? I called it the Matthew Project. And um, I just want to update you on something real quickly. It won't take very long. Something that we talked about with this. If you remember, this this teaching was all about examining Yeshua's quotes from the Old Testament in the book of Matthew whenever Yeshua actually quoted or made a strong allusion to the Tanakh, um, but it's recorded in the book of Matthew. Um, that's what we looked at. It had nothing to do with the chosen. I just like the picture of that guy. Um, and you remember that uh, this whole study that I did was inspired by this quote when I read this quote on Facebook um, and it talked about that uh, 180 of the um, 1800 verses were quotes from the Old Testament. I thought that that's too low. Got to be higher than that. I thought really only 10%. So that's what inspired me to do uh, what I what I did taught on last year. And I started doing my own research uh, just to try to verify that. Just kind of uh, on my own. And when I traced this quote on the internet, it took me to this chart. And this is a chart that the guy who did the quote, Harold Wilmington, this is a chart that he had. And I went and checked all his references. And in the book of Matthew only, I could only come up with 19 references that he had listed of where Yeshua quoted or made strong allusion to the Old Testament. And I thought, oh yeah, it's going to be way more than 19. I, I know it is. And so, again, I did my own study, and I came up with 66, right? Way more than what uh, Harold Wilmington, at least in that chart, had, um, had done. And again, this was just Matthew. I decided not to try to do all the Gospels. I thought that would be too overwhelming at first. So here's the update. Since then, I've gone back and looked at the other three Gospels, and I've added all that to the 66, and here's what I came up with. 84? Uh-oh. That's way lower than I thought. I thought it was going to be way more than the 180, and it's only 84. Um, so uh, here's the deal. I'm not really sure what to make of that. Uh, and I'm kind of confessing that uh, maybe I read Harold Wilmington wrong, or maybe I didn't do a good job of research. I did check all the parallel passages, and I did not count those. And so possibly he counted those parallel passages. But this, those numbers I have right there do not include parallel passages. Those are 84 different times that Yeshua quoted or strongly alluded to the Old Testament, to the Tanakh. Now, maybe Wilmington was saying any mention, you know, if you say the word Moshe, ooh, that's one. But I, I wasn't doing that. I was making a, a pinpoint reference. Um, so anyway, again, I don't know what to make of it. If you ever want to do your own study, I'll be happy to share your, my notes with you, and you can see uh, where we came up with it. But um, I just wanted, for the sake of uh, clarity and uh, being true, um, I, I wanted to make sure that it went on record saying that um, I couldn't find as many. I thought it would be way more. I stated that last year. It's going to be way more, and it wasn't. So I'm sorry. I don't know. Anyway. Um, so as I updated that, as I was studying the other three Gospels, that's kind of what led me to what we're going to talk about today. Because um, when, when, I went through, um, when I went through the Gospel of Luke, I was just really inspired um, by, okay, now we're not going to talk about Star Wars. So, um, yeah, I was just really drawn to Luke, and I thought this is kind of a fun picture. 
but we're not, there's no secrets um, to being a Jedi Knight within the book of Luke, um, but we are going to look at some good passages today. Um, now, uh, let's get a little bit of background um, before we get into it. Who was Luke? Uh, what we definitely know is that he was both the author of the Gospel of Luke as well as Acts, which places him as being the person that wrote the majority of the New Testament. He has more words and verses. And, you know, I learned that. I would have definitely put my money on Paul. But, uh, no, it's Luke. If you add up the number of verses and words, uh, he apparently is the only New Testament author that's clearly non-Jewish. Um, and we know he was a friend of Paul. He went on a couple of different uh, missionary journeys. And, of course, what a lot of people know about Luke is that he's thought to be a doctor. And um, uh, it's pretty clear in Colossians. He's called the uh, beloved physician. But also, I, I noticed that um, there are more recorded healings um, in the book of Luke than the other Gospels. So that kind of makes sense for a physician to be documenting those things, you know, kind of dealing with healing and medicine and such. Um, and it's also, Luke is more descriptive of things like Yeshua's birth, death, and resurrection. Again, that kind of goes hand in hand with what you might think from a physician. Uh, we know this also, that both Luke and Acts were written to Theophilus. So who is Theophilus? Don't really know for sure. Some think he was a Jew that had some kind of higher social standing. Others think he was a Roman official uh, because uh, Paul calls him most excellent. Kind of sounds like that would go with a Roman official. But um, a lot of people think, and maybe not a lot, some at least, think that uh, it's no one in particular. It's a title because if you look at uh, the Greek, the Theophilo means friend of God. So it's perhaps that this is just a title that is being written to the friends of God uh, in the future that we'll read. So anyway, but we do know it's addressed both uh, Luke and Acts addressed. One more thing here I want to point out is how unique that Luke is because there are lots of basically what I would call monumental things in Luke that we don't find anywhere else, uh, like the Annunciation. It's a pretty big deal. And um, that, that wonderful uh, story of Yeshua at the temple, um, that's only found in Luke. A lot of people think that that was basically represented his bar mitzvah. So it was a, it was a real important part in his life. Only find that in Luke. Uh, some of the parables like the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, uh, Lazarus and the Rich Man, those are only in Luke. So Luke is is chock full of really important things and um, well worthy of our study today, of course. So what we're going to do today is we are just going to first examine a few verses that just kind of jumped out at me as I was uh, studying it and reading uh, through it. There's no particular topic right at this point. Um, we're just going to uh, look at some verses together. Uh, this is going to be uh, one of these uh, teachings where it should lend itself to lots of interaction. Yeah, these these uh, verses are all taken from the scriptures, so it's got some uh, kind of tricky Hebrew words in there. Sorry about that. Um, but um, And what I want you to notice uh, when we read this passage about this husband and wife, notice that it says they are both righteous and that they blamelessly walk in the commands. Okay? So who can guess what Deuteronomy 30 and 1 John 5, what do they teach us about this passage? knowing that 
these two walked blamelessly in all the commands. What do you think? Did I trick you already? Boy, that's a tough one already. Yeah, what uh, those verses both tell us is that his commands are not too hard. We have an example right here of a husband and wife that blamelessly walked in his commands. They're not too difficult. They're not too far off. We can handle it. You know, we can't use the old, nobody could do all that. It's, it's impossible. We can't use that excuse. The Word of God says it's not too difficult. So I'm going to go with that. You know, it's about relationship, isn't it? It's not about a checklist. i got to make sure I check off everything in the Torah. It's about relationship. So that's what we need to re- keep in mind. All right? If you got a comment, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm going to keep plugging away. Wait for the mic, Will. Wait for the mic. I like, uh, I like how... Uh... At the end of the verse there, it tags on in all the commands and righteousness of Yahweh. And it makes me think of, I don't know if it's in Luke or not, but there's this one person that comes to question Jesus, and the the writer is saying there were some people that trusted in their own righteousness. And they yes. said, you know, well, what do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And I think it shows that, like, walking in his commands, incredibly important, but can't trust in your own ability to do it. You have to rely on Yahweh to do the work through you. Yes. Um, because in our own strength and in our own knowledge, we're not even going to understand his commandments. We have to we have to ask him to reveal his ways to us. And that would get back to the relationship, right? If you're trying to do it on your own, forget it. Forget it. And, and to piggyback that, like, it changes. Like, I think that we can walk in his commands and righteousness to the best of our knowledge at the time. Every, I, I think every single Passover, Yahweh reveals a new layer, yeah. a new depth, a new, something new that draws me in even deeper. Amen. And it doesn't mean that what I was doing before was wrong or bad, but it just means that we're deepening our relationship. Amen. Thank you. So this is Mary, this is the mother of Yeshua, right? And she is visiting with Elizabeth. And what I really love about this passage is she's basically pouring out her heart here. She's kind of like giving her testimony. And as she's as she's speaking, she's weaving in these passages from the Psalms, right? She's just pouring out what Yahweh has done. And she weaves in quotes from Scripture. Yeah. And it reminded me, I don't know if you've ever met anybody like this. We met this family down in Texas. This was a homeschool family named the Ballyette family. And they, they had their own little uh, kind of like bluegrass uh, family band. And they were, I think, from Montana. And they traveled around just, you know, singing and uh, giving testimony and praising Yahweh. And we got to know them in Texas. We saw them. And the father there, Bob Balliet, I had a few moments where we, uh, we just sat in fellowship a couple of different times. And I'm going to tell you, you could not converse with Bob Balliet without him quoting scripture. I'm not talking about a Bible study. I'm talking about just talking just shooting the breeze around the campfire. He could not not quote scripture. It was like, that's the way he talked. That was, that was his, his verbiage. So it was so inspiring to me, you know. Wow. And I kind of got that feeling from Mary here, you know. As she's talking, he's just quoting scripture, you know. What a, what a true testimony, right? I mean, she made a good mother for Yeshua. I all right? Yes, sir. I guess the other thing that I saw is 
when, when it says things like, as he spoke to, that almost looks like a reference of a quote or something. And, and that, to me, would be Genesis 15, where he's saying, look at the stars. Uh, I'll make your, your seed like, you know, the sands of the seashore. So there's, there's another reference, if you want. Yeah. An illusion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed." to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him and he began to say to them, Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the synagogue that day? How many of you have seen The Chosen when they do this scene? It's, it's really... Intense. It's very good. Um, yeah. So let me just make a little point in this passage. This is not really anything new, but it's like I can't, I can't help but point it out. Okay. Um, this word fulfilled here. We've talked about this before, right? That's the Greek word pleirao, and it's the exact same word that we have seen. In Matthew 5 17 the exact same word okay and you know that in modern Christianity oftentimes when they look at the word fulfilled it brings with it an extra meaning of being brought to completion brought to an end okay and um, that causes problems when you uh, compare scripture to scripture and especially in this verse we're looking at today, this passage here in Luke, there's some problems if you interpret that uh, fulfilled as meaning completed, brought to an end. And uh, the problem is this. If that really does mean that, that it's completed, brought to an end, that means that we no longer need to proclaim the good news. We need no, no longer need to proclaim liberty because Yeshua said himself, I have fulfilled this verse in your hearing. Now, is that asinine or what? Of course, that does not work. Of course, we need to keep proclaiming the good news. Just because it's fulfilled, it doesn't mean it's brought to an end, right? It's fully preached. It's um, perfected. It's fully lived out. It's not completed in that it's brought to an end. So I know that's kind of a soapbox that you hear a lot, but I just could not could not, not talk about it when I read through this. Okay? Got it? Anybody? All right. Moving on. Now, who can identify this picture? What's going on here? The rich man and Lazarus. Okay, Benjamin, bring, bring the mic to Benjamin. Benjamin, can you just tell us the story here? What, what's going on? Yeshua tells the parable of a, a rich man who lives his life in luxury and fine colors and a beautiful house while Lazarus is outside covered in sores, begging for only the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. And then both, both die and in the parable... Yeshua says that the rich man looks across to Abraham's side where Lazarus is being comforted and cries for cries to Abraham to have Lazarus bring him a a drop of water just to to for the tip of his, his yeah, finger the tip of his tongue and then Abraham says you had what you had in life and now he gets comforted yeah. And uh, the rich man says, well, then have Lazarus go back and tell my three brothers. Yeah. I think five. five brothers. 
That's excellent. What? Hold on, one more. Uh, since I got you on the spot, so <laughs> what? What's the punchline? Do you remember the punchline at the end? Oh yeah, punchline is Abraham says. <laughs> Abraham says to the rich man. He has. They have Moshe in the prophets, and if they don't listen to him, they wouldn't listen to someone raising yeah. back from the dead even. Yeah, I tell you what, that. That blows my mind, right? I mean, think about what he's saying here. He's literally saying that Moshe and the prophets carry more weight in terms of communicating Yahweh's salvation than it would if you saw someone raised from the dead. Isn't that what it's saying? You ought to believe because of Moshe and the prophets more than if you saw somebody Raised from the dead. Whoa. That's big. Go ahead. Well, it's interesting that you point this out. I've, I've been listening to uh, a teaching series from 119 Ministries, and they, were, they pointed that out, how they believe like Yeshua is making the actual comparison between Lazarus and who they think the rich man is and who different scholars have thought the rich man was to be the high priest, to be the high priest at that time. Oh. And that comparison just interesting because Lazarus was raised from the dead and they still didn't listen to him and it was past he was in the grave three days or more and Yeshua said or when the messenger came to Yeshua you know he was like well you know I'll come eventually and I think from what I remember the Jewish concept was the soul was still in the, the body for three days until it left so they were like we got to get here within three days but he didn't so they're like no he's dead Lazarus did raise from the dead and they still didn't believe him. Interesting. It just also makes me think of when Yeshua said that if you believed Moses, then you would believe me, for Moses wrote of me. Amen. As I studied Luke, and I was going through this, um, there were a couple of different things that, you know, kind of stuck out to me like a, a theme, and one of them was the number of times that it referenced the temple. And so uh, I thought I'd just take a moment and let's talk a little bit about Yeshua's uh, special connection to the temple. Look, look at this. These are all the different times that the book of Luke talks about Yeshua at the temple. And, uh, you know, we talked about uh, earlier how he was at the, in his father's house. Um, you know, that was a really important thing for him. And We've always heard about, you know, he cleansed the temple with his zeal, you know. But um, look at all the different times that he's teaching in the temple. That's where he was to connect with the people, and uh, they were looking for him at the temple. So it's a very special place for him. And um, I, I know I'm confessing my own uh, negligence as I grew up in the church, the, the temple meant nothing. It really meant nothing. And I don't think it should be that way. If it meant what it meant to my Savior, it should mean something to me. Now, obviously, we don't have the temple the way that he had it, uh, at least not at the moment. But let's not just disregard it and think that there's nothing to it. I know that Mike Friesner has studied the temple or been to uh, a conference where they now, there's so much there that we can learn. Um, so I'm just, myself, I'm, I'm wanting to know more uh, of, of the temple. And um, I guess I'm encouraging everybody else. And I wanted to point out, too, that at the very end of Luke, we notice something here. Um, this is, you know, at the ascension. And notice what it says about the disciples. They were continually in the set apart place. So Yeshua's disciples, after he left, they were still hanging out at the temple. They were continually there. So there was something definitely special uh, that he ingrained into his followers. Um, and I just, I just don't want us to just blow it off and ignore it. Now here's something that you might uh, think about. This is a book that is soon to be available in our own library here. And uh, it's a book about 
Yeshua's Love for the Temple. I've read this book, and it's uh, very, very good, and um, gives you some insight about that. So hopefully in the next uh, few weeks, we're going to have the library up and running, and if you want to get um, Ben Hilton's book, you can check it out. We're going to do a little something different right now. I hope that this is going to go well, <laughs> but when I tell you what it is, you'll know why I'm hoping that it will go well. Uh, I have asked Mr. Olson. I've invited him to do his thing, and uh, not really sure what it is. I haven't seen it yet, so we're going to see. But I'm just joking. I invited Mr. Olson to um, use his imagination with our kids and tell us a little bit about the story of Zacchaeus. Um, so, Mr. Olson, whenever you're ready. Tim lent me this book uh, last, last time we were together. Uh, and I, I kid you not, the title of the book, Tim Bali's Masterpiece Theater Chronicles of Really Great Short Men of the Bible. I think I'm the one being set up. It's one of his classics. I'm going to, and he called me this morning, so that makes sense, at 6.30, and he said, hey, I'm teaching on Luke, hey, you got anything in that book that maybe you'd like to share? And so I found something, and uh, we're going we're gonna to take a moment and uh, get ready for that. Uh, do you mind if I go ahead and shut down the, the screen? No. Okay. Where's John? John, can he help me? John. So, there. do you need this? No, I don't. I don't need that. I just have a microphone, and that should do you me. You just want me to turn that off? Yeah, you can turn that off. Okay. All right. I think I can do that. Well. Oh, would it be easier there? Yeah. The the deal is that, um, when it comes to reading classics, and I hope I hope I got this right. Zacchaeus. Well, okay. Uh, we're gonna go with that. Uh, uh, masterpiece Theater, we're going to set the stage for you a little bit and kind of get ourselves uh, set up for that. Just a second, if you will. I might need some help along the way. Hold on. If you've, if you've ever seen Masterpiece Theater, then you know. Oh, this is a second. You have to create the ambiance a little bit. Okay. And of course, I'll, I'll probably need some help if I, if I follow the script a little bit. There we go. Okay. Let me get to the passage. Well... Actually, to start, I'll probably need I'll probably need someone for my location here. Where's Brendan? Brendan, you mind coming here for helping me out, just setting the atmosphere? Put this on, would you? That's great. Sit in this chair, would you? And uh, put on these glasses. Can you speak with an English accent? Yes, I can. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Okay. Yes, let me find that was. Okay, keys, keys. Oh. It says cue the music. Cue the music. Oh, cue the music. Here. Okay, you're gonna read this story about Kias, would you? The tale of Kias the Taxman. It happened many years ago that a certain taxman lived in the land of Jericho. Jericho was a little hamlet between Politico, Pol Politico and Away We Go. The man's name was Kias, and his life was about to change forever. That's great. So now it would normally be the commercial 
but we're going to talk about Kias. Uh, let's see. Oh, you know, before we can get to Kias, actually, we've got to, we've got, I've got to introduce another fellow for you. Uh, let's see here. I look at my notes. Oh, yes, yes. Um, would you come up here, good sir? Is she sleeping? Oh, 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 there you go. Wow, there you go. Uh, Kias. No, no, no. I just needed Barbarossa. Uh, we, uh, we have a fellow that Kias is going to meet. His name is Joshua Barbarossa. And the, the thing, oh, before I get started about, about Joshua, is there's probably a little uh, audience involvement that will help to set the stage, get our feel for this. So anytime I say, and the people were amazed, I want you to say all together, wow. Okay, so ready? And the people were amazed. Wow. Good. And for the next one, you say, ooh. The people were moved. Ooh. The people were amazed. Wow. Okay, now you're getting it. And the people rejoiced. This is hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, Joshua Barbarossa was uh, a kindly man. He had a message from heaven. He walked about and did good. And he, was a, he, uh, he, he showed people the way. And he said, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. And the people were amazed. Wow. All right, you can have a seat. Thank you. OK, so let's see here. That's, uh, that's the first part. Go on. OK, I'm just checking here. All right, so that's key as we cue the music. People. Oh, yeah, that's right. So now we need, we need a tax office, unfortunately. Okay. Oh, well, actually, let me get a couple of chairs up here. Sometimes you need chairs. And I need, I need someone who looks like an upstanding tax man. Uh, uh, there we go. Okay. Oh, oh, that's right. I never. Come back up here, Barbarossa. That's right. And uh, would you come up here, sir? Yes, there we go. You see, uh, this man traveled about the countryside, and usually he went by metro. So he was on the train. He was on the train, and the train conductor had, of course, has to announce, next stop. Next stop, Jericho. Jericho. All uh, departing for Jericho, leave the train. All departing for Jericho, jump off the train. And, wow, he's good. <laughs> so Joshua put his hand on the shoulder of the conductor, and he said in his very esoteric, deep theological voice, I must pass through this country. I must pass through this country. So he got off the train. You may both sit down. Give them both a hand. Thank you. That's good. That's amazing. So now I need a very honest-looking tax man. Oh, uh, yes, come on up here, John. That's great. Okay, good deal. And I need some honest-looking people. Uh, why don't you come up here, miss? And why don't you come up here, sir? And, and uh, well, why don't you come up here, sir? Okay. And you just stand over here. That's good. These are honest, hard-working citizens. Oh. oh, that's right. Well, these were honest, hard-working citizens. Here, put on your honest, hard-working hat. There you go. And uh, put on your tax hat. Okay. You got to have to look the part. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. So, there we go. Oh. Oh, you're... By the time we're done, you, you wish you were in Sweden. Okay, hold, hold on to that. So, you have to go into the uh, assessor's office and find out how much you have to pay. So, come on in. Oh, oh dear. Oh, that's true. You have a seat here, and you just wait your turn. And, and you look at your papers, and you say, it looks like you owe 35 Hanukkah gelt this year. Like, 
It looks like you owe 35 Hanukkah guilt this year. But last year was 25. But last year was 25. And prices go up. Prices go up. Oh, so she hands over her 35 Hanukkah guilt, and he l jingles it, listens to the sound. Oh, he loves that sound. And of course, he puts it down over here, and he says, 25 for Caesar. 25 for Caesar. 10 for me. 10 for me. Oh, and she is a little disgruntled. She says in her deep theological voice, I am disgruntled. I am disgruntled. And she stands over there. Come on over next victim, uh, next tax person. And you say, this year you owe 50 Hanukkah guilt. This year you owe 50 Hanukkah guilt. And he does the quick figuring in his head. And he says, I've only got mo Monopoly money. I've only got Monopoly money. Well, you're going to have to pay the exchange, too. Well, then you'll have to pay the exchange as well. So he gives him the, the money. And, of course, he's also disgruntled. And he just simply says, er, er. He goes over there. Come on over here. And, of course, and yes, there's, give it a jingle. Make sure it sounds right. Okay, so it's uh, Bitcoin. But anyway. <laughs> So, oh, Mara, we, need, uh, we need another. Come on up here. Uh, so my, uh, Michael, would you like to come up too? No, no, not yet. Um, let's see. Uh, would you come up, Amy? Oh, yes. Oh, that's very nice. We, we just need some more people for the, uh, the tax crowd. Go ahead and put that on your head and join these compassionate people over here, hardworking. Of course, Kias, the tax man, just simply looked at him and said, You owe. You owe. Oh boy, hands them the money. So off they go. Give these people a hand. Just stand over here though. Stay right here. So that night, of course, Kias takes all his money home. Well, the tax money home. And he's going to lay down in bed and think about all of the money he's made. However, he has to read the times first, stand up. Uh, and we'll kind of walk in a circle for a minute. You're off walking on your way home. Okay. Oh, that's good. Just right there. Come on up here, good sir. Would you? Uh, let's see. Uh, see. Yes. Um, may I? Ha Where's Gabe? Where did that man go? Oh, okay. No, no problem. Uh, may I use you, Tony? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Good. Good. So we need you two fellows to get down on your hands and knees side by side right here. Okay, so side by side. Oh, a little closer, there we go, that's good. Okay, uh, so um, here, put your money down beside the bed. That's it. And now you're gonna sit on the edge of the bed. Sit on the edge of the bed. And he's going to look at the Jericho Times before he hits the bed. And he's reading. And he reads about this man, uh, about this man, Joshua Barbarossa. It's like he's got a message from the Lord. He's got, he's bringing righteousness and he's bringing conviction and he's doing good things. He's doing miracles. And it's kind of bothering him a little bit because, well, that's not exactly his method of working, his modus operandi, right? Anyway, he throws the paper on the ground, says, dumb paper anyway. Dumb paper anyway. And he lays back on his bed. Okay. Can you do it? No. You can do it. You can do it. I'm here. I'm here for you, brother. All the way. There we go. Good, good. And he's, he's sleeping calmly and casually. And he's comfortably. No, he's not. He's tossing and he's turning. And he's turning and he's, he's tossing his eggs and his cookies. Okay. And he sits up. And he says, I can't do it anymore. Stand up. I can't, oh. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. I, I guess I have to see this guy, Joshua. I got to see this guy, Joshua. There. We, we will give the bed a rest. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. You may go sit down. Thank, give them a hand. Like, that's like comfort right there. All right. So the next day, oh, now we have to set the scene again. Okay. Um, why don't you stand over on that side? Because if we have you stand over there, you might get stoned. Uh, anyway, so now we, we need to create the, the scene. Yeah, the busy scene in the city of Jericho. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
downtown Jericho, you know what uh, all downtowns from long ago kind of look like. We have a little bit of foliage there, kind of sets the, sets the atmosphere for the place. Uh, who do I need? Oh, uh, Josiah, would you come on up, sir? And uh, let's see. Who do, oh, Glenn, would you come up? And yes, why don't you come up, uh, Mr. Brown? That's good. Okay. All right. Go. All right, good deal. Um, you, you can sit here, and uh, Casey, you can sit here. And uh, Would you stand in between these two gentlemen? Okay. This is normally where we would have a commercial break, but we don't have any commercials, so we're, we're safe here. Okay. Uh, I just need to take a moment and get these guys into costume. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, this is this is what every busy downtown Jericho that I've ever known looks like. You you've got a little bit of uh, stuff right there where people meet, and so we have a rock. Tell me about yourself, Rock. Pick it. I delete it. I have the neck that sick to offer. Storing spit those traveling from offer. Mine is a possible system, and may have to receive. Good, good. He is the rock. And, and the bush, let's find out about the bush. Lo, that I am the bush that sitteth at the right hand of the mighty oak. My leaves flourish, and I find in my daily task to nourish weary sojourners, donkeys, and cover children playing hide and seek. This is my station, and I rise to meet it. Wow, well, let's hope there aren't any donkeys. Your wife hopes there are not any donkeys in this one. And this is the mighty tree. Let's hear from the tree. Behold, I am the great oak planted by the forefathers that I shall, that I should stand thus, a pillar of strength and shade. Yea, my quest and purpose is to render comfort to all passers-by. A meeting place for comfort and a child's playtime high town. Oh, a child's playtime high Wow, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was, I'm quite moved. If anyone else is moved, the, the restroom is right over. Well, okay, that's good. That's good. Oh, oh, sorry. To some, I present myself threatening to others a refuge and comfort. That's very, that's very <laughs> okay, so apparently we need a small child to climb up and play in the tree. Would you come up here, sir? Okay. Um, uh, uh, we, um, okay, let me think about this just a minute. Uh, oh, uh, oh, hey, look at that. Look at that. I'd say he's a little more like a willow, but wow, check that out. Whoa, let's hear it for the tree and the climber. It's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, good deal. Okay, so, uh, and not to lose our story, we're back to Kias, our tax collector. I mean, our tax assessor, chief tax assessor. Come on up here. And he's going to wait right here. Uh, wait over here by this bush. Uh, you never know. You might, uh, this, because we know this is uh, downtown, this is where things happen, and he'll probably see Yeshua. Saw him in the Jericho time, so obviously he's going to pass by this way at some point. Well, so here he is, and then lo and behold, who should come up? But of course, Joshua Barbarossa. And what does he do? Oh, but wait, he's not the only one. Uh, I should say, Kias is not the only one who has read the Jericho times. In fact, we have uh, some people from the media. Would you come up here, ma'am? Yes, yes. And and would you come up here? And you come up here? And are you busy? Oh, come on up here. Okay. You stand right here. Stand right there. Okay, let me get, let me see some prop things here for you guys. All right. Did I, oh, yeah, there you go. Let me get, well, there you go. Uh, how about we put this on uh, Brad? Put 
this one on you. There we go. Okay. Everybody knows that the press wears fedoras. Here, um, one of you hold that. Right, hold that. And, and uh, you're going to get comment. You need to find out. So come on over here. And before this man gets a word out of his mouth, you are right in his face. Okay, ready? And you say, what do you say about walking on the water? What do you say about walking on the water? How many paralyzed people have you healed today? How many, how many what? Paralyzed people. <laughs> how many paralyzed people have you healed today? Have you sent any pigs over the hill lately? Have you sent any pigs over the hill lately? Right, give, me, give me any comment you want yeah, on, the, the, on the weather. Give me any comment you want on the weather. Okay, so, you know, like all these very important things that they have to talk about. So, naturally, Kius sees what's going on and he steps forward in front of the bush. But before he gets too far, the people come and they crowd around. And here they are behind the press and in amongst the press. And they're all saying, oh, Joshua, Joshua. Oh, Joshua. Hey, give us a word. Joshua, give us a word. Hey, give us a healing. Give us a healing. Tell us something new. Tell us something you know. Uh, about the kingdom. About the kingdom. Okay, so there they are. They're, I mean, they are there. And so, uh, Kius, let's see if we can get over. We can't get over there. Okay, go in front of the rock and see if you can... Uh, Maybe step on the rock and... No, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. So, uh, he, uh, this is a little frustrating. So, Kius, of course, says, this is a little frustrating. It's a little frustrating. And in the meantime, here, step over here a little bit. Uh, in the meantime, there's a little boy up in the tree. And he says, hey, mister. Hey, mister. What's the problem? What's the problem? Wow, there's a lot of stuff around here. I can't, I can't see Joshua. I can't see Joshua. So, the boy says... Well, why don't you come up in the tree? Why don't you just come up in the tree? There's room here. There's room here. Let me just check that real quick. It does say that. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's uh, have you uh, hop down, and um, why don't you step on the rock here? Just slide over a little bit. And then there we go. And uh, there you go. Move this. Rock over. We'll just move the rock over a little bit. There we go. And an upsy daisy. Oh, about that. Oh ho! He's up in the tree. Yeah. Well, uh, I think they call that the nosebleed seat. Anyway. And and Kia says, "There he is. There he is. I can see him. I can see him." And of course, at this moment, Joshua says, "And the kingdom of heaven is like." The kingdom of heaven is like... But suddenly he stops, and he says, Lo. Lo. I don't know why he said lo, but it sounded good. And he points over to the tree, and he says, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. You come down. You come down. And, and oh, that's right. Oh, man, you're ahead of me. You're ahead of me. And the people were moved. And he said, I'm going to your house. I am going to your house. And all of the disgruntled people and all of the media, they lost their breath and they went, <gasps> <gasps> and yet Zacchaeus got down quickly and went over and joined Yeshua, uh, Joshua. Ooh, that was a slip, wasn't it? I, I, I went off script there for a moment, sorry. Okay, so all of these people went back over here. Come on over here, people. And you stand over here because you're going to look in the window. Okay, Bush, thank you. You are done. Tree, you have finished. Th oh, wow! This is one moving tree. Rock, you're solid. Thank you. You may give these, uh, this foliage and this granite person a, a hand. Thank you. Yes, that's it. That's it. Thank you. So here they were. Oh, yeah. They were having supper. Um, may I have my bed back? Uh, I, I need a table now. Just two. A table for two. Okay, so, you, yeah, you're just, you're just right here. Oh, okay, all right, over there, yeah. Side by side, same, same as before. Uh, and, yes. Oh, it is a table of two. That's, that's correct. Okay, so, we're going to have... Joshua sit here. We're going to have Kius sit here. Well, I was thinking about that, but 
uh, and he says, he says, are you enjoying your borscht? Are you enjoying your borscht? Very kosher. Very kosher. Very delicious. Thank you. Very delicious. Thank you. And you know, he is just being convicted left and right and, and, and left and right and left and right. So to finally, oh, before he does, all of the people, of course, are looking in the window and listening and watching because they want to, they want to get a word. They want to know what's going on here. They, I mean, does he not realize he's eating with sinners and tax collectors and people from the IR? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, so at this moment, he is, throws back his chair gently. That's right. He gets down on the edge of his table on his knees, puts his arms up on his table, and he says, Oh, Joshua. Oh, Joshua. I am convicted. I am convicted. I'm going to give away half. Here, hold this, would you? I'm going to give away half my goods. No, down on the table. Oh, there. That's how people do it. Make it really sound, I mean, like they know you mean it. Half my goods. Half my goods. And if I cheated anybody? And if I cheated anybody? And everybody over here cleared their throat? <laughs> I'll pay them back fourfold. I'll pay them back fourfold. And they all thought about that and did the math real quick. Oh! Woo. And, and, and all the people were amazed. And, and Joshua said, this day, this day, salvation has visited this home. Salvation has visited this home. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so let's see here. And, oh, yes. Uh, and the people rejoiced. Hallelujah. Oh, good. Okay, let's see the next thing. Cue the music. Cue the music, I guess, if we have music. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Oh, and... And we finish reading the story. How does it end? And Keith lived happily and righteously thereafter. Thank you, the end. Woo. Thank you all. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was awesome, wasn't it? I'm telling you. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I didn't know what to expect, but uh, we got our money's worth today. Thank you very much, David. So jumping back into the rest of the teaching here, um, as I studied through this, I did notice a second, not necessarily a common theme, that like it's the only common theme in the book of Luke, but at least it was something that stuck out to me as a common theme, I talked about the temple, but here's another thing. So what I'd like to do now, uh, who's got the microphone, Melanie? Okay, I'm going to put up about six or seven verses, and I want you to just read them all, Melanie. Just bang, 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 bang. And then when we get through all those, then we're going to see if Melanie can guess what I'm considering a common theme in those verses. Okay, these are all from Luke. And Melanie's just going to read them all. So um, here we go. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I forgot to stick that up there. So here we go. Ready, Melanie? All right. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than Johanna the Immerser, but he who is least in the reign of Elohim is greater than he. For whosoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall save it and said to them whoever receives this little child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me for he who is least among you all he shall be great for everyone who is exalting himself shall be humbled and he who is humbling himself shall be exalted whoever seeks to save his life shall lose it and whoever loses his life shall preserve it but not so with you, but let him who is greatest among you be as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. And one more. 
And he also spoke this parable to some who relied on themselves that they were righteous and looking down on others. Two men went up to the set-apart place to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began to pray with himself this way, Elohim, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, swindlers, unrighteous, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I acquire. But the tax collector, standing at a distance, would not even raise his eyes to the heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, Elohim, show favor unto me, a sinner. I say to you, this man went down to his house, declared right, rather than the other. For everyone who is exalting himself shall be humbled, and he who is humbling himself shall be exalted. Okay. So, do you see a common thread there? What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, the least, the first shall be last. Um, you know, when you serve, that's what makes you great. Can you put it into a word? One word? One word? Starts with an H. Oh, humility? Yeah. At least that's the way I'm describing it, you know. And I, again, I'm not saying that it's the only theme or thread, but when I was reading those verses, I, it kept coming back to humility. And um, so I want us to just take a look at humility for the last part of what we're going to do today. Um, and we're going we're gonna to step outside of Luke. And the man Moshe was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Read the next one, too. He guides the meek ones in right ruling, and he teaches the meek ones his way. So this, this is a pretty strong statement for Moshe, isn't it? You know, he is more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. And, um, you know, considering the way that we're going to learn uh, how much emphasis Yahweh would put on humility, that's a pretty strong statement. Now, in both of these passages here, the uh, Hebrew word is uh, anav, and um, we're going to look at a lot of different Hebrew words. Uh, so just keep in mind that this one is anav, all right? Keep going. And my people upon whom my name is called shall humble themselves and pray and seek and turn from their evil ways then I shall hear from the heavens and forgive their sin and heal their land. Very famous verse, right? I love this verse. Everybody uh, knows this. Uh, the Hebrew word here is another different one, kana. And what, what I want you to notice is that humility is listed first, right? It's kind of like without that, forget the rest of it. You need to be humble. If if his people will first humble themselves, then the rest of it will be in order. So um, humility is, is very important, I think. We're going to find that out. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Right. Okay, and we have a third different Hebrew word here still meaning the word humble, translated that way. And um, notice how right here it's pitted against proud. Humility and pride are kind of pitted against each other. Okay? So keep that in mind because we're going to see that uh, a little bit more. Uh, it's the same thing that you see here in uh, Proverbs 3.34, which is quoted in both James 4 and 1 Peter 5. Let me read that for you, both of those. James 4, 6, but he gives greater favor because of, of this, he says, Elohim resists the proud but gives favor to the humble. 1 Peter 5, 5, in the same way you younger ones be subject to elders and gird yourselves with humility toward one another, for Elohim resists the proud but gives favor to the humble. So, again, you know, you can see that pairing against pride. And I think that's going to be key uh, to what we're looking at today is you've got to, if you want to be humble, you've got to keep pride at check. Micah 6.8, he has declared to you, O man, what is good 
And what does Yahweh require of you but to do right and to love loving commitment and to walk humbly with your Elohim? Amen. Love that verse. Here we have the fourth different word, Hebrew word that's translated as humble or humility. And, I, you know, basically we have here, Micah's given his, like, bottom line of, you know, walking, uh, what's expected if you're an Israelite walking with Yahweh. The bottom line is um, loving commitment and walking humbly with the Father. So humility is crucial. That's, uh, that's something we can't get around. Thus says Yahweh, the heavens are my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build for me? And where is my place of rest? All these my hand has made and all these that exist, declares Yahweh. Yet to such a one I look on who is poor and bruised of spirit and who trembles at my word. So in this, in this uh, translation, it's translated as poor, but in many others it is humble. And this is, yes, the fifth different Hebrew word that can be translated that way. So I'm exactly like you, uh, Melody. I was thinking, wow, five diff- at least five. There may be more. I don't know. So I'm appealing to our Hebrew expert. And um, I'm just wondering, does that give us an insight to the complexity of humility? That it's multifaceted, that there's so many different ways that it can be exercised or um, understood. Would you agree that you have to use five different Hebrew words to get get it translated? Anybody have any other thoughts on that? I mean, that struck me too as being like, wow, these are all different, you know. Therefore, as chosen ones of Elohim, set apart and beloved, put on compassion, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, Patience. Humbleness of mind. So it, it's kind of a reminder that we're not talking about a physical being puny, right? We're talking about a mental, uh, uh, in your heart, a spirit of hum- humility, right? We're not talking about being weak, so to speak. It's mental. Um, these are all listed. Well, humbleness right here is listed with other uh, ones that are fruits of the Spirit. So it's it's a very good thing to be listed among the fruits of the Spirit. I call upon you, therefore, I, the prisoner of the Master, to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called, with all humility and meekness, with patience, bearing one another in love, being eager to guard the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. As I looked at this, it, it kind of stuck out to me that it's talking about calling. Whatever your calling is, you're to do it with humility. It doesn't, you know, it's not specific to this this calling. It's like whatever you're called, whatever your calling is, approach it with humility as well as some other things. And again, humility is listed first. So I don't know. I, I, I think that means something. If then there is any encouragement in Messiah, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, one in being and of purpose, doing none at all through selfishness or self-conceit, but in humility consider, consider others better than yourselves. For let this mind be in you which you also which also is messiah yeshua who being in the form of elohim did not regard equality with elohim a matter to be grasped but emptied himself taking the form of a servant and came to be in the likeness of men and having been found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death death even of a stake. Elohim therefore has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. You know, something that, as I studied this verse, I I don't know, I may be a little bit off here, but uh, this is what I was thinking. I have a question for you. Um, Would you say 
that humility is a trait that the Son and the Father do not share. Because we know the Son was humble. This, this verse. But I don't picture the Father as being humble. Why, why would the Father need humility? I don't know. It's just, we know that the Son and the Father share their one, right? They share many, many, many attributes. But I don't know about humility. Um, I think the Abba Father would have had to have humility in order to sacrifice his son for us. Okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. Thank you. So I'm reminded of uh, Moses and Abraham when they had petitioned uh, God not to destroy these people. And he adhered to them. You know, he bent for them. In humility, I would imagine. Well, yeah, and compassion, no doubt. Is humility and compassion the same? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I see it. It's just a thought. It's nothing, it's nothing that, uh, you know, changes anything. That's all a, a full discussion on its own. I mean, these are good thoughts. I guess when I think of the King of Kings, it's not a, a question of, it's not an issue because he's not susceptible to something about it. But, uh, you know, what was said, you know, that he, he in, in Yeshua, it says the, the epistles, dwells the Godhead bodily, you know, so therefore there's an absolute connection point in all aspects. Um, there's, there's humility there probably just in ways we, we cannot fathom and don't think about so much, but obviously if we are to emulate that, he's got it. Uh, it's just simply that he, he doesn't have, <laughs> we don't have a checklist on him being absolute perfection to say, well, I'm going to see how much humility you have. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting thought you have, Tim, because it could also be said that um, he doesn't, he never has had to submit either. To submit to who? You know, right. so, so right. we all have somebody to submit to. We all have somebody who's over us, but he has yeah. no one over himself. Yeah. So I, I see the situation you're, you find yourself in. Food for thought. One more over here. Yeah, just one more. Uh, he said, come, let us reason together. That's pretty humble. I mean, to say to man, us, mere men, fallen in corruption, let us reason together. It's pretty humble. Amen. Amen. Charlie. I was just going to say, um, as a father, I think I have how, how he is humble. God is humbled in his own way. If we're his children, you know, when I... When I, when I gather up my children and take them somewhere. I say, this is where we're going to go. You're going to come with me. We're going. There's not really an option for them to reason with me and say, well, but I want to do this. Still, when my children come to me and say, I want to do this, I listen and I, I sometimes I allow it to change my mind. And okay, we're going to go a different direction. So I think God could be compared to that the same way, he is the ultimate our authority. We have to do what he says, but he still listens to us. He still hears what we have to say, and and you know that takes some form of humility, in the very least. Thank you. Good good thoughts. Okay, we're going to finish up here. This is a book, also soon to be available in our library. Um, I've read this book by C.J. Mahaney. I'm one of the weird people. I, I read the forward and the introduction of a book. Some people just jump right to chapter one and get going, but I read the forward most all the time. And in this, in this book, in the forward, C.J. Mahaney is talking about when he first started considering writing this book, at first, he was like, no way. I want no part of it. Because, you know, when you write a book, 
if you think about it, you're basically posturing yourself as an expert on that topic, whatever you're writing about. And so who wants to be the expert on humility, right? Uh, he's kind of like setting himself up for a problem. And um, uh, so anyway, he, I, I think it's a good book. Um, I, I enjoyed it. And I, I really like this quote. This is from uh, Mahaney. He says, humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. So it's an honest assessment. When you compare the two, that, that brings humility. Okay? He had a nice section where he listed these different ways to cultivate humility and to kill pride because we talked about how those go hand in hand. And so he listed some hands-on suggestions. And I just want to throw these at you. These are, these are not all the ones that are in the book, but some of the ones that stood out and spoke to me. Some of them are daily things you could be doing. Some of them are more long-term that, you know, as you go on your journey. Begin your day by acknowledging the dependence, your dependence on God. Every single day, you need to start your day acknowledging this. Now, you can do it how you want. For me, when, when I first wake up, you know, and I realize, hey, it's a new day. I lived through the night, and I'm alive to see another day. Boom. That's when I start acknowledging my dependence on him, my gratefulness that he gave me another day my gratefulness that I have breath in my lungs that I can breathe and face another day. I give him the glory and the acknowledgement for that. So that's the first way that we can cultivate humility. Practice your spiritual disciplines. Now, you should be doing this anyway. Even if you're not working on humility, we need to be praying. We need to be studying the Bible. We need to be worshiping. But these are key to creating humility in our own personal walk. Reflect daily on the cross, right? Ultimately, it all goes back to the cross. If we don't have the cross, we have not much anything. So we need to keep, be, keep being reminded of what happened on the cross and what was sacrificed on our behalf. This is a hard one. Invite and pursue correction. You want to stay humble? Ask your brother, your sister, to correct you. Look into your life. That'll keep you humble. That's a, that's a great one. Not so easy to do, but a welcome suggestion. Respond humbly to trials. Because a lot of times I think, I know in my own life, I'm going to blame somebody else when there's a trial, when something's not going my way. You know, what did I do? You know, you need to respond humbly. Look to the Father. Identify evidences of grace in others. This is a very interesting one. He points out in the book that when you're looking at evidences of grace, you're looking at things like the fruits of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit. When you see those things in someone else's life, when you see someone living out the fruits of the Spirit, encourage them. Tell them about it. Thank them for that. That keeps you humble. It gives glory to the Father. It helps um, It helps the, the kingdom progress, right? So when you see those evidences, they're only doing that because of God's grace. My beautiful wife is so, so important to me at this stage of my life. But she, she's that way because of God's grace in her life. You know what I mean? She serves me because of God's grace. So those are the types of things we want to point out to other people. Encourage and serve others every day. Yep, you knew that one was coming. You want to be humble? Serve. 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 We all know that. And you, you guys do wonderful. We've heard testimonies of people serving. So we're doing it. Keep doing it. Laugh often and laugh 
often at yourself. Yeah, that's a great way to stay humble. I mean, when, when I got egg on my face, laugh about it. Enjoy it. Don't try to hide it. Yeah, great suggestion. Play golf as much as possible. Oh, are you kidding? Yes, this is true. I mean, is there not a more humbling game in the, on the earth than off? It doesn't matter how good you are. That thing will humble you. Right? And kind of the bookend of where we started, at the end of the day, transfer all the glory uh, back to the Father. Whatever happened in your day that had anything to do with good, give Him the glory for that. Any, any way you were blessed, that you blessed someone, give Him the glory. Thank you so much. It's uh, my pleasure uh, to speak and share. Not, not being a real teacher, I'm uh, just sharing, sharing what I've learned. Oh.